Hello, this is Carl from LunchboxSessions.com. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us today. So great that you could uh, log in and join us from wherever you are out there in the world. I see on the, on the chat screen that a number of you have already indicated that you've logged in from Brazil and from Pakistan and from places all over. And, and that's just great, thanks for doing that. So many of you ha have uh, responded to messages in LinkedIn over the last few days to let me know that you're healthy and safe. That's so fantastic to know, very challenging times for us. Some of you have let me know that in your home country or in your home region that you're, you're actually in a home lockdown scenario and really can't leave your house much right now. It's very challenging times for all of us. Some of you have recently also messaged me and emailed me to let me know that you've lost your job and, and that's a very, very difficult circumstance to be under, most challenging for sure. Uh, hopefully what we do today while we're having a chance to play with hydraulics and we'll share a little bit of what we've learned over the years and perhaps you'll have some questions for us that we can answer and hopefully this is helpful to you as well at a time when perhaps you're not busy on the job and you can pick up a few more things or clarify a few more issues in terms of hydraulic functions and hydraulic troubleshooting and maybe that'll be great as you head back out to your job. So. Thanks again for joining us here today. It's great to see out on the web so many people openly sharing their knowledge uh, on various social media platforms. That's so great to see. And so here we are. This is our very first time doing YouTube Live. So please be patient with us as we figure out our methods and techniques and, and uh, lots of things for us to learn in the last few weeks as we got ready for this. I'm used to being in front of a classroom and or in front of a, a group and then I can see faces directly and, and see eyes and make face, facial contact. So this is a little bit of a different environment for me. But I know that you're out there watching and so that's great. Uh, here in our own company, of course, we're under requirements to do some more distancing and so that's unfortunate. There are a few people here in the building but we're well spaced out and others of us have gone home to work. Uh, some, of, some of our team works from home uh, as a normal course of action in any case, but um, yeah, I've got my son who's looking after the, the camera work and the open broadcast here today, so that's great to have his involvement. It would be great if instructor Mark could join me here. Um, it would be a lot of fun for us to do this together, but distancing requirements in, in the time of this virus has uh, has us apart for a time, but I'm certainly missing Mark. Hopefully he'll be here and, um, and join me in a broadcast on a future date, or maybe he'll do one on his own. He'd have lots of things to share too, especially for those of you interested in reliability topics and contamination. So hopefully we'll be able to, to see you again. Uh, we're gonna do another one right away on April 28th, and that one is going to be on pilot pressure and pilot controllers. And so tune in for that. That'll be a lot of fun to have your involvement for that as well. Um, what else should we say here as we get ready? Don't forget to sign in. If you're watching us over YouTube Live, you won't be able to comment unless you're logged in, signed into your YouTube account. That lets you comment and chat with us during the broadcast, so do that. Some of you who are using the G Suite or, or Gmail, perhaps you'll just have to sign in to, to your uh, to your Gmail account and then when you switch over to YouTube you may find that the chat is running and that you're able to participate. Yeah, do let us know over chat where you're signing in from. It's great for us to find out where, uh, where you're watching from and participating from. Send us comments, send us questions during the broadcast and that will be great. Definitely let us know what questions you've got as we do our session today and I will try to catch up. I'll stop a few times along the way to, to read your comments and questions and see if there are things there that I can address. If you had a dying question and I just didn't get around to it or I couldn't answer it for whatever reason, then don't forget that you could contact us after the broadcast as well. Feel free to send an email to info at lunchboxsessions.com or if you want to contact me personally, an easy way to get a hold of me is on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn quite often. If you look up Carl Dyke, industrial teacher, I should be pretty easy to find if you're not linked with me already. 
send me a connection request, and that's a great way to keep in touch too. On the YouTube uh, broadcast there, you should see just below the video window some information, and if you click a little down arrow for more info, there should be three links there to PDF files that have some data, some data sheets, some specification sheets about the valves and electronic amplifier that I'll be using today for teaching, and that might be helpful too if you want to play along and just have a look at some of the details up close. So feel free to download those. Maybe if you have a printer nearby, you might even choose to print those files out and have the pages in front of you on your desk. We'll be together for about an hour, maybe an hour, up to an hour and 20 minutes today. And if for some reason you can't stay for the whole live broadcast, that's all right. This will be saved as a video and will be on the Lunchbox Sessions YouTube channel after we're all done. So you won't miss anything in that regard. I'm just going to take a moment now to give a shout out to our great friends at fluidpowerworld.com. Fluidpowerworld.com is a great website and resource to go to on components. It's also a great place to learn about what's happening in system design and in system engineering. Also keep track of the events link on their website. It's a great place to find out when the Fluid Power Technology Conference is happening. Of course, under current times with the virus, um, person, uh, in-person conferences are, are a little difficult to, to schedule and organize and know exactly when they're going to happen. But there are events planned for Minnesota and also for Detroit. So keep an eye on that events link because I'd love to meet you at one of those conferences as well. Lots of great sharing and learning goes on at those conferences for anyone who has any involvement with the fluid power industry, whether you're an OEM, system designer, engineer, component uh, maker, all kinds of involvement there, even including the colleges and universities. So keep an eye out for that. All right, lots of chat uh, messages coming in and um, a little bit of information there that we're just keeping track of. Things look all right. Hopefully our audio is working all right. Some, some information there that I'm just going to adjust the position of my microphone a little bit. All right, so let's get on with the topic of the day and maybe I'll just come close to the table for now. Um, our topic today is proportional directional valves. In this case, I'm holding a valve that is not. This is a valve uh, commonly in use that is only an on-off valve. If you fire one solenoid or the other, you could cause a hydraulic cylinder to extend or retract, or you could cause a hydraulic motor to turn one way than the other, but there would be no way of metering the flow. Once the solenoid is activated, that would be it. The cylinder or hydraulic motor would be at full speed. There would be no way of being gentle or accessing alternate speeds, not if we just use this device by itself, an on-off style valve. But if we switch over to a valve that is a proportional directional valve, now we've also got the ability to control speed. And that gives us a lot of possibilities. And so we're talking about spool type of valves in this uh, seminar together. And what you will not find in the on-off type valve is these metering notches on the spool. Those will not be present. V-shaped, sometimes U-shaped metering notches on an on-off valve will not be there. And that's the secret or part of the secret in any case for proportional directional valves where we can also control speed is that we've got to have some kind of fine metering notches. And this spool came out of a, a Sauer Danfoss PVG32 valve section. Usually those are lined up in a, in a group and held together by threaded rods. And look at that, there's the lever on one end. Just to remind us that not all proportional valves need to be operated by electrohydraulics. It could be lever operated and a forklift operator lowering a pallet to the ground and just before the load gets to the ground if the operator knows what he's doing with that lever and has a spool with the metering notches can make it look like that load is landing softly on a cloud. In this particular example of the valve though down here in the pilot section is electrohydraulics. We can lose the handle 
and still operate this valve. And in this case, we've got an amplifier circuit card that's usually buried in the potting material. And we've got a number of electrohydraulic poppet valves that know how to push the spool back and forth. And that's, so that is a hydraulic pressure piloting in the end for this valve. And we'll cover some of those types of valves in a future seminar. There's also a little instrument here that is measuring the position of the spool, allowing us to do very fine corrections with the feedback information coming from that sensor. The valve that we're going to spend a lot of time with today is this particular series of valves from Eaton Vickers, KF DG4V series of valves and we have a number of clients who use it. This particular valve I believe came from about the mid 90s and we've cut a quarter of the valve away. I recently got around to painting and that's helped a lot so we can see clearly inside what's happening and there you can see it inside the metering notches which is what makes this valve able to produce um, a flow rate, variable flow rate for a hydraulic motor or a hydraulic cylinder. We'll see that there are solenoids, a solenoid on each side, and that's good. I'm going to put it back down. It's getting heavy. A solenoid on one end for extending our hydraulic cylinder or turning our hydraulic motor in one direction. Another solenoid for retracting or spinning our motor in the opposite direction. And we're going to see this valve in action in a moment here when I hook it up to an amplifier card. These are not your normal solenoids. They're not just a winding of wire with an armature in the middle. Most proportional drive solenoids will also have a permanent magnet involved and some very careful work with the windings and so are considerably more expensive, the solenoids, than the kind found on the on-off valve. What else is important in this particular series of valves is that position sensor. This looks like an extra solenoid, but it's not. It's an LVDT, Linear Variable Differential Transformer. Wow, that's another mouthful. And that's a type of position sensor that is watching the position of that valve spool inside the valve and allowing us to make, allowing the, the control electronics to make very quick corrections to any inaccuracies in holding the valve spool in position. So that's an instrument that we're going to see in action as well here in a few moments. So for all of this fine control, since these are not on-off solenoids, since we send variable current into this type of solenoid, and because we need to read this sensor, there needs to be control electronics involved. And so we're going to be working with a Eurocard mounted amplifier. We'll see ours on the live training stand in a moment. That's from this series that you see here. And lots of different adjustments and controls and things we can measure. And this type of amplifier card is preparing the variable current drive signal using pulse width modulation that is needed to send variable current into the solenoid. Don't worry if I'm getting ahead of you here, we're going to measure current. We're actually going to see those values in action. And also on board on this type of card is the instrument or is the electronics needed to read the LVDT and do corrections and lots of fine tuning and adjustments we could make as well. That's just uh, one brand. Um, we've got some other valves here on the table as well. We've got a similar type of valve from the same size category from Bosch Rexroth. It too has an LVDT. And again, there might be similar Eurocard based amplifiers that one could work with. Some of you have already written to me to let me know that, hey, you know, lots of modern valves have their electronic card on board. Well, that is true. Onboard electronics or integrated electronics means that that amplifier is on the valve and is not at a separate card location in a control cabinet. And that's another option as well. Also very popular. When it comes to teaching about proportional valves, though, I really like the, the, um, the standalone cards because there's so much we can learn by having those things separated. All right, let's, um, let's have a look at what we're going to do with this valve. Right now, I'm going to bring up that nameplate on screen here and let you have a look at what we're doing here. See if I can find my photograph. Uh oh, lost my photograph. What happened? Is that on my screen? 
I just, uh, I think you found out a lot about my photos there for a minute. All right, there we go. Um, let's have a look and see what, uh, what we've got here. We've got the nameplate for the valve that's got a cutaway, KFDG4V, and then the number five. So if you printed out the documents that were there on the YouTube channel, you'll already know a little bit about the model coding. And so these first um, six characters or so are basically just identifying the series of the valve. I'm going to look at a PDF file in a moment. You can see the symbol there for the valve as well to let you know that this is the P port where the pump inlet is. We've got T, return to tank, and then we've got our work ports A and B, which head out to our hydraulic cylinder or our hydraulic motor. Very popular to see this configuration involved with hydraulic motor. Some of you would even call that a motor spool. And if I just move up a little bit, you'll see the porting arrangement for this valve. That triangular shape is, is what is standard to a valve that comes up as size 5. Have a look at that number 5 there that you see in the red line where the model code is. And that size 5, D05 in North America, or very common in parts of Europe, would be referred to as a C-top 5. And that triangular pattern of porting is pretty typical. We see it also on this valve here that isn't cut away. Okay, so we've had a look at it. We see that there are bars above and below the valve symbol to let us know that this valve is not an on-off valve, it is infinite positioning. We also get some clues as to the valve being proportional from the diagonal arrow that is through the solenoid. What does the diagonal arrow mean? That's correct. It means that whatever that device is, solenoid, it's a variable device, meaning it receives a variable amount of signal, current in this case. All right, what else do we need to know? If the, a, if the small letter A solenoid comes on, it will push the valve spool, and in your mind's eye, you would animate that the P to A path has become connected by this straight through arrow, and that B has gone back to tank. Well, we're going to see the valve in action in a number of ways. Also have a look at the next series of letters and numbers here in the red model code line, 33. C50N, that's probably all we need to keep track of as I now switch over to one of our data sheets. And so bring up that data sheet if you have it there at home or if you printed it out wherever you are. And let's just have a look at this catalog. It's for the entire series of valves in the size 5 category that you see there in the upper corner. And so I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. I really like looking at data sheets on a regular basis, even just reading some of the intended features that were meant to come with a particular valve that, uh, that we encounter when we're visiting with one of our clients in industry. Here's already a view of a model option for this valve that lets you have integrated electronics instead of the stand away card that we'll be using. And then we get down to this part here where we can already start to analyze the letters and numbers in the model code. So KFDG4V, the first six characters that we saw in our valve nameplate, tells us that it's a proportional valve. We didn't have a letter B, so our, we don't have int integral amplifier. We have amplifier mounted elsewhere. The F lets us know that, that we have an instrument for measuring spool position, the LVDT. That's what the letter F tells us. D says it's a directional valve, so we're good to both extend and retract a cylinder or turn a hydraulic motor clockwise and counterclockwise. And then G letting us know that it's a subplate mounted valve where bolts drop down onto a subplate to mount it. Some people would say that's a factory type of valve or a mill type of valve, but hey, I'm not sure exactly what's mobile and what's stationary hydraulics these days as a fair amount of components do go back and forth. I have encountered subplate mounted valves on mining equipment, oil field service equipment, and uh, the four lets us know that it's a solenoid operation type of valve. So that's the first six characters, very basic. There's that size five letting us know 
that, um, that that's where it is in the sizing category. And then from there, we march into a description of the school. So we were looking at our nameplate, and we noticed the numbers 33C50N, and you will find that here in the second grouping of uh, vowel spools. In fact, if I grab my, my highlighter here, this is what we often like to do. Mark does this a lot here. He's usually putting highlighter on the actual model line for something that we're analyzing to remind us of what option we've got. And so what we find out here <coughs> is that we've got that type of valve that has that blocked off P port where A, B, and T are all connected together. Some of you would refer to that as a float center. Some like to call that a, a motor spool. These are all fine. And we find out that that is a valve that is well sized for 50 liters per minute or approximately 13 US gallons per minute. So that's the sizing of that valve. There's a smaller version, a 30. There's a larger one, a 50. And that's for just that particular configuration. If we'd had a valve that started off with 2C, then it would have been all ports closed at center. What else is available? This is interesting. A zero lap valve. We'll talk about that one a little bit more in a moment. A zero lap valve is a valve that won't need us to play with the dead band compensator at all. This valve is ready to set flow onto the A work port or the B work port the moment uh, a signal is given. It's a, it's a valve spool that lets us move into servo types of functions. So you're seeing some different scenarios that are available there just to let us know what it is that we're going to be working with. And if I come back to the top of the page, we'd find out that there's even an option for something called an asymmetric spool. And that would come in very handy if you have a very large rod cylinder with very differential uh, volumes for, for extend versus retract and allow you to do some fine tuning for, for flows in both directions if that were the case, if there were some very different uh, flows from rod end to blind end. All right, that's probably all we need to look at there for now, other than to maybe scroll down to the next page and notice that, well, here we go. There's that, there's that zero lap valve. There is that valve that we said that allows us to almost perform like a servo valve. All ports connected together, but restricted. Yeah, it's defining a valve that's trying to be closed, but just barely accomplishing that. The slightest movement of the valve and there's flow in action. All right, 33C series valves, that's us. That's our symbol that we saw a moment ago. And here it is again over on the chart. Let me find it one more time here. 33C50, yes, there's your conversion. 50 liters per minute or roughly 13.2. Does that mean that this valve could not work with flow rates at all above 50 or 13 gallons? No, that's not what it means. It just lets us know though that at that flow rate, the valve already is about a 150 PSI pressure drop all around, uh, or approximately 10 bar all the way around for both the A, for both P to A and B back to tank, a loop flow. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment because you're probably noticing up here a reference to five bar and 75 PSI, but that's only for one flow path and there's two because we're into directional valves, all right? It could handle, the valve could handle higher flow rates than just the 50 liters or 13 gallons per minute. But to learn more about that, a designer, a system engineer would refer to some of these charts that we'll see down here. We won't spend much time with it. Oh yes, here's a good example on the right of the looped flow path, letting us know that if we had fluid moving P to A perhaps and then back B to T, somewhere on that A and B side might also be a hydraulic motor or a cylinder, but just the pressure drop across the valve itself is what is shown down here. Star, star C50N, that's our valve that we're looking at. And so at 50 liters per minute or about 13, as we see it down here, 13 gallons, we'll find out that's where our 150 PSI pressure drop is. Could we have flow rates up to perhaps 100 liters per minute? 
and uh, roughly 26, 27 gallons per minute, we could, but at that level, your valve itself will already be about a 500 PSI, no, maybe as much as 750 PSI pressure drop, and so that's quite a bit, and perhaps you would choose instead to have a larger valve so that you wouldn't have such an energy loss and heating just across the valve. So it's a nominal value at 50 liters per minute, 13 gallons when the valve itself is not representing too much loading or, or power requirement for the hydraulic system. What else should we have a look at? Some people really like to look at these graphs and curves, and if you're an engineer or designer, they're very important to you, of course. This particular view here lets us look at how linear the flow is through the valve as we move from zero on the lower left corner of the x-axis out to 100% signal of the valve. How linear is that flow as we move through the rated gallons per minute, liters per minute, as described over on the y-axis. So if there's lots of curvature, it lets us know that the valve response is not that linear. And last but not least, not going to spend much time on this one, also is a chart letting us know how fast can the valve respond to changes in signal. And so frequency response testing is something that a valve manufacturer does using sine waves and then they plot a graph like this to let us know that as you oscillate back and forth the full open and full closing of the valve many times per second, maybe for an example 10 times or maybe up to 30 times per second, full open and then return to zero on the valve, what happens? Well, 90 degrees over here is letting us know that by the time we've changed the full signaling of the valve on, off, on, off with a smooth curved sine wave, that the valve's response in putting out the desired flow rate may now lag behind the electronic command signal by up to 90 degrees of a sine wave. Not going to take any more time today to explain the fine points of a sine wave. Many of you will know what that's about, but that's at least a little bit of a look at what we're doing with a particular valve that's cut away. So. Now let's switch, over to, uh, let's switch over to our control electronics for a moment and think about that, that amplifier card. That's what I want to do here for a few moments. We'll just try to bring that one up on screen. Might just take us a moment to get that up and running. This is one of our many simulations that we've made over the years. This one is from 2008, so this is a pretty... Uh, <coughs> pretty pretty much a way back 8-track for us, but still working well. And what you might notice is very different about the front of the panel is that instead of little multi-turn potentiometers where we have to put a tuning screwdriver in to make the simulator easy to use, we just took the liberty of attaching some larger control knobs that are easier to work with on screen. Otherwise, it's the same thing. And I think I've got everything turned on that I need on this one. Yes. All right. I've just got to set some connections. Yes, Z24, that's drive enable for the valve overall. And over here on the upper left-hand corner, we have a simplistic depiction of external electronics. <coughs> These electronics that you see in the upper left-hand corner have to be uh, built up somewhere else outside of the amplifier card. And so I've got a simple potentiometer running here that's drawing from a positive, negative 10 volt DC source that's actually available from Z2 and B2. And so this is just a very generic wiring. Your connections may need to be different. Um, the manuals explain what, what connections may be needed, whether you're working with plus and minus 10 volt drive to a proportional valve system, whether you're working with 4 to 20 milliamps, um, instrumentation, control, current, that's also very a popular scheme. So this is just a very generic scenario for driving a signal, a command signal, as the manufacturer calls it, into the amplifier card, requesting movement from the valve spool. And so over on the right-hand side of our screen is our hydraulic symbol for a proportional valve. Oh, this one's closed center, but that's all right. It's a generic depiction of a 
of a proportional valve. It has the infinite positioning bars. It has the solenoids with the diagonal arrows passing through it. And that's all great. So one of the interesting things, though, that confuses people in the mind's eye when we're working with a proportional valve is to end up in a position like this if we're animating the position of the spool symbol and one might think, uh-oh, now the flow path is cut off. I'm uh, just going to see if I can get some extra labels here that I like. No, we're good. And so our pump flowing in appears to be blocked, our return to tank and our aim. No, nothing is blocked. As soon as the valve leaves its center position and moves in this direction, it's important to remember that we are in this porting path, but perhaps only partially so, and thereby metering the flow that is available to us on this flow path. So that's just a little animation note. I guess if you see this valve in action and something to keep track of on any of the simulated proportional valve symbols that show up in lunchbox sessions if you're using our lessons. Okay, Lots of different features that we're going to be working with on the card. The left green LED letting us know that 24 volt control uh, voltage is coming in from a power supply that's on the outside of the system but the card itself is making a good uh, 15 volts plus and minus 15 volts DC that's needed internally so two green lights tell us that our control voltages are in in great shape um, a yellow LED here to let us know that drive to the card has been enabled so that the valve will respond there's a red LED here that will indicate an overload condition to our solenoids the, the card automatically protects itself if something is happening with the wiring that goes out to the solenoids or the solenoids themselves. They're already very low resistance, and so if it gets any lower, uh, it's important for the card to shut itself down and prevent a short circuit condition. That red light comes on and the card shuts off drive to the valve. What else? We've got another red lamp here letting us know if a problem comes up with the LVDT. That's this little symbol for LVDT. And if a problem comes up, a red light will come on and the valve will again shut itself down. There will be a solenoid um, current level LED that will glow at different levels to let us know approximately an interpretation of the proportional current when you see that one on the front. Okay, there's a lot of features that we won't have time to spend, but this, this valve also has something called digital logic inputs commands that can be sent in with just a full 24 volts, and then the signals can be, the proportional value can be tuned here on the front of the card, and then you could have four different speeds for an actuator, but they could be selected with a digital signal. Oh yes, keep in mind that all these different inputs I'm talking about, switches or in this case the potentiometer, are usually signals coming from output cards from a programmable logic controller and not so often manual controls. So even this analog plus and minus 10 volt DC signal, or if you're using the 4 to 20 milliamp signal, that may be coming from the analog output card on a PLC. We're just simplifying for teaching purposes. All right, let's just go back to the center position here for a moment. At some point, we're going to see a feature called deadband compensate in action here. I'm just going to dial up the deadband values. And what you'll see now is as I move the, the, uh, the, the potentiometer in the slightest amount, the valve just jumps to an open position. And it looks like it's not being very smooth anymore. And we'll get into why that's happening. And then we also have control over gain which allows us to size the valve appropriately. We'll do that one live on the card. Ramps, I will only show you here in the simulation today because I can't turn the potentiometer fast enough on our panel to show you the effect of it. So I'm just going to turn this all the way up. I'm going to enable ramps and then I'm going to disable our drive here and just let me go for a maximum amount of ramp control. And what you'll find out is that we activate the valve. It's going to take a moment to get into position. Oh yes, it could take up to five seconds on this model of valve. So the valve isn't exactly snapping into position now, it's taking its sweet time getting there, and that's if ramps are enabled. I'll turn that back off. Down here at the very bottom of the simulation is LVDT, and that's that instrument that's tracking the position of the valve spool. And so as I work that back and forth, let's see, I've got to turn off my ramps, I'm gonna turn on my drive enable again. 
What you'll see down there at the very bottom of the screen is that there are three windings. You could argue there's two, but there's a primary winding that's being excited by a sine wave of a certain frequency. And then there are two more windings, but they're in series, and they're on either side of the primary. And as a very small armature passes through the middle of the LVDT, it changes the amplitude and the, um, and the polarity of the sine wave is opposite on those two secondary windings. And the difference is measured and used as feedback in the control card to decide exactly what position the spool is in and whether or not there should be a correction signal. Because we're going to see some correcting signals happening live here as I hook up the valve and we'll see that LVDT doing its job. So it's feedback information and it's just a particular type of instrument called a linear variable differential transformer. Wow, say that fast a whole bunch of times. I'm just going to go back to my photograph here for one more moment. Try to bring that up. Uh-oh, let's see where my photograph went. Uh, let's see, here it is. Is that showing correctly on screen? Okay, good. And I'll go up to this spot up here. There you go. You can see when I had the valve taken apart a few weeks ago while I was painting, you could see the, the small diameter armature that moves through into the windings of the LVDT that I was holding in my left hand. All right, it's time to go live to our hydraulics training panel. Maybe I should also, yes, I, I see in my cue cards that I was going to answer some of your chat questions. So let's just take a moment and see what's coming up in the chat screen and see how things are going. See if there's any questions there that maybe I can answer. Some of you saw some chattering. Okay, yeah, if things get choppy on your side at times, there will be bandwidth issues from, from different uh, sources. Maybe someone was asking, would it chatter? Okay, so Jim, let me see if I can follow your original question. What would happen, Jim asked, what would happen if you gave a, a plus or minus 10 volt command to a valve built for four to 20 milliamps or vice versa? Yeah, wow, um, good question. So when you look on the nameplate of your valve, Jim, it's pretty important to identify which option you've got, especially if you have onboard electronics. Of course, you know that. Um, I guess, you know, what I find out about so many of these valve amplifier cards is that they're, they're designed quite smart. And in many a case, Jim, um, these valves will sense that you're sending in the wrong signal and will go into short circuit protection. Is there a way to, to damage a valve by sending it the wrong type of signal? Absolutely. This one here is designed for a 4 to 20 milliamp input only, this particular valve, so it's not meant to see that 0 to plus and minus 10 volt, but I'm going to hazard a guess that the amplifier card designers often think of these mistakes and have often found a way to have the valve protect itself. Uh, valves will sometimes have a self-resetting fuse inside so that once they cool down they'll become active once again. Yeah, it's not that easy to burn out the amplifier cards. I hope that's I hope that's helpful, Jim. Great question. And yeah, everyone needs to be as careful as possible, but sometimes mistakes happen. So thanks for that question, Jim. Let's move over now and work with some live hydraulics. And we're going to do hydraulic fluid later with a pump. But for now, I'm going to take all the connections off of our, of our live connected hydraulic valve. I'm going to move them forward onto the cutaway valve because we're going to actually see the cutaway valve in action, we're using the, the Hirschman uh, DIN style connectors here. Very typical uh, connector. So I'm all wired up and ready to go, I think. Yeah, that looks good. I color coded my, my leads from my two multimeters, so I'd hopefully not get too confused as to which multimeter I'm working with. And we should be good to go. I'm just going to turn on one multimeter and introduce you to what's happening on the right multimeter soon as I turn my 24 volt um, instrumentation power back on. That's coming from elsewhere. And then inside the control panel here, we have a potentiometer that is sending in a command signal to the amplifier, 0 to 10 volts positive, or I can switch to the opposite polarity and send in 0 to 10 volts negative. And this particular potentiometer here is sending in that command signal to 
the amplifier card, but that's electronics and controls that are happening away from the hydraulic system, away from the amplifier card. And, and in many a case, this potentiometer that I'm turning now is replaced by analog output from a PLC output card. But what I wanted to show you by looking at this multimeter here on the right, nothing happening. Um, yeah, well, the multimeter on the right is just the command signal going to the card. So the entire time that you see me working this potentiometer during our time today, just imagine a signal between 0 and 10 volts. Let's see where it is. 10 volts is around the 5 o'clock position on the potentiometer. Up here at about 12 o'clock, you'll be picturing somewhere close to 5 volts. And then as we head down here to the 7 o'clock position, we're pretty much at zero volts and that's not going to change and I want to show you that because I will be changing what I use the right hand multimeter for and we'll be measuring something else but when you see me turning this potentiometer to command the valve amplifier it will be a zero to ten volt signal either positive or negative polarity okay right now we're in negative polarity and that would be used to power the A solenoid on the right hand side. Oh, and it is, isn't it? Let's have a look at what's happening in the valve. I'll go back to zero. So I'm back at the seven o'clock position, zero command, and as I turn up the potentiometer to five volts, the A solenoid came on, gave our valve spool a push to the left, and as I turn it all the way up to 10 volts, all right, so you already can sort of match what I'm doing with my command signal potentiometer and what the valve spool will do. But now as I switch over to positive polarity, and I dial it in once again. Now we'll see the spool move to the right because it's the B solenoid that came on. And the B solenoid is pushing from the left side and moving our valve spool to the right. So that's a very basic introduction there. Okay, um, let's get in close. I'm just going to change the position of my multimeter leads now and get ready to do some other things. On the front of the card, and if you printed it out, you already know this, I'm going to turn on my left multimeter as well. So my left multimeter is going to be watching a, a monitor port for the command signal, but if you read in the, in the specifications for this card, this is a conditioned command signal. So even though you saw 5 volts here when I was at the 12 o'clock position, it may not always turn out to be so. This is a conditioned command after we take into account card adjustments, which I haven't made yet for valve gain, which is about sizing the valve, for dead band compensation, which is about making sure that we look after the dead spot in the valve in the right way, more on that in a minute, and ramps as well. So this number on the left multimeter, which is reading our command signal feedback, is, is a condition signal. So it may not always match with what you saw a moment ago on the external signal. The other multimeter now, the right-hand multimeter, I'm going to plug that one in instead now to watch the LVDT as feedback. And just take me a moment to get my 2 millimeter TP2 test leads with the smallest finger guards into the monitoring ports. And now we've got, now we've got two multimeters and they're both reading the same thing at this moment. And that's a good thing. It means that the, the valve moved and that the LVDT which is what we're reading on the right multimeter now, that's that spool positioning instrument, has, has, sent a command, has sent a conditioned signal back to the monitoring port on the front of the amplifier card to let us know that the valve is matched to the command signal. It's in position and it went exactly to the place where it was supposed to go. All right, so we uh, will dial that signal back down to zero. And I think we're working with the, just let me check my settings. Yes, we're working with the solenoid on the left. I've got the B solenoid being actuated. And again, as I slowly turn up the potentiometer, for the most part, those two multimeters match. And that's already a good thing from the troubleshooting point of view, because any time when they don't match may be an indication of trouble, especially if the left multimeter signal, our conditioned command, if that changes a lot and our multimeter on the right, which is the LVDT feedback monitoring, doesn't move, the value doesn't change at all, then that would be an indication that the valve is stuck. 
Okay, maybe before we get too far, let's just have a look at metering notches and think about how this valve is creating flow once again. So right now we're in the center position. You saw earlier that there was a triangular arrangement of ports and that the port that's been cut away that was right about here and went down to this particular pocket in the valve body, that was the P-port. It's gone missing because I did a quarter section cutaway on this valve body, but this is where the pump's input would come in right there and be sitting in this undercut and ready to produce flow on either our B work port over here or our A work port. These would go out to the cylinder or the hydraulic motor. We've got two return to tank ports, one on either side of the valve, but as you know, in the subplate, that T port would become one hose going back to tank. All right, so as I turn up the command signal and get our valve to move into action, if all goes well, what we'll eventually see over here on the B work port is just a tiny amount of metering notch showing, and that's letting us know, and it is the smallest amount too, and that's the valve wide open. That is as far as that valve spool travels. That's our wide open 50 liter per minute flow path. But of course, keep in mind, there are four of these metering notches cut around the diameter of the spool, and that's our proportional control of flow. As I bring the valve back towards closure, you slowly see that metering notch start to disappear again, and we eventually get that valve in a good closed up position. Now this valve spool was by no means a zero lapped valve, meaning that when this valve spool is at center, the B work port and the A work port are thoroughly cut off to give you a good closure so that your hydraulic motor is not turning undesirably, your hydraulic cylinder is not moving undesirably. And for this series of valves, it takes up to 20 to 30 percent of the total travel of the spool in one direction before you actually uncover and start to get a flow rate out of your work port. And so all of that travel, that zero to 25 percent approximately in both directions, is your dead band. It's a lot of travel zone for the valve where you could be electrically signaling, electronically signaling the valve from a PLC and there would be no change in flow. And so if that was undesirable from a control standpoint, then we could make an adjustment to the front of this valve called dead band compensator. Here it is here, the dead band compensator, and we could adjust dead band for the B work port action or for the A work port action and get this valve to jump into action and uncover that metering notch a little more quickly with the smallest amount of command signal. So right now I have no dead band dialed in whatsoever, but we could choose to, to compensate if we wanted to. Okay, let's try that now. Uh, since I'm hooked up, I'm operating the B side, I'm going to dial in some, some dead band adjustment. And by the way, these are 20 turn potentiometers. And so quite often a question is, would they be damaged if you turn them too far? Well, listen carefully. Can you hear little clicking noises? I don't know if you can hear this on your end or not, but there's little clicking noises happening, and that's letting us know that we hit the slip clutch at the end of the potentiometer run. So no damage. And that lets you know that you're all the way dialed out in one direction or the other. And then from there, you can dial in. And so 20 turns would be the maximum amount of dead band compensation. I'm just going to go for roughly half amount. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I didn't count very accurately, and that's all right. What we're going to see now with the valve is as I make the smallest amount of potentiometer turn, the valve makes a jump and I don't actually have fine control of that very beginning and ending amount of valve action anymore, but maybe we've deliberately dialed it out. I'll just go for maximum. I'm hitting the slip clutch on the other end. All right, so I've got the maximum amount now. Look at how far that valve jumps with a command signal that is very small. The smallest amount of command signal, but what you'll notice Okay, this is where things have changed. Remember that I told you before that when our potentiometer was at 7 o'clock, that's just starting from 0 up to 1 volt. Well, what that does now, command signal, once it's conditioned by the card, 
our multimeter now reports that the slightest bit, that's probably only about uh, 200, 300 millivolts from my external electronics, but it's already become a jump to a full 5 volt signal for, uh, for driving the valve spool. And that's that dead band. It's just saying, hey, small amount of input command voltage from the PLC or the potentiometer and just jump our valve to the open position. But then from there, all the way to the end, we still have proportional control. It's just in that area near the center, the dead band. I'll show you a graph again on screen in a while about that dead band compensator. Okay, so we've had a good look at that. Let me dial that back out so I don't forget when we change to the hydraulically powered valve. Okay, it's good to be able to see the valve in action and see what's going on. Oh, I know what we want to do while we have this valve exposed. Is, uh, is play with some other features as well, like gain, for instance. So this valve is a, what did we say it was? We said it was a 50 liter per minute sized, normally sized valve, roughly 13 US gallons per minute. Well, maybe we're never going to have that flow. Maybe we're never going to have more than half of that amount of flow. And so maybe it would be nice if the command signals, 0 to 10 on the input electronics, would only result in half of the drive current to this solenoid, which would give us better resolution control of the flow of the valve with our full range of process input signal. Well, in that case, we could, we could resize the valve. We could make the valve smaller. And so I'm going to head over to my B-side um, gain control, and I'm going to turn it down. Usually the default would be it's turned up all the way to full gain, but I'm going to back it all the way down to minimum which I believe takes this particular series of valve down to about a quarter of the size. So we're going to basically cut down the size of this valve to a quarter. Drop my screwdriver there. We're just going to turn the size of the valve right down to a quarter of its original. And now what we'll find out is the full range of input signals, command signals going into the valve, now result in only a very small amount of motion of the valve spool. It was pretty small. Did you see it? There, I'll put my screwdriver close by and I'll turn it back down. We're finding out that might not even be enough on this particular valve spool to get flow to occur, right? But basically the full range of 0 to 10 input from our external electronics, come have a look up here at our left, we're still sending 10 volts from our external electronics into the amplifier card, but it's being resized to only be a 0 to 2.5 volt uh, drive signal internally in the electronics. So we've literally quarter sized our valve. In fact, I'm going to keep the I'm going to keep the input from our external electronics at 10 volts and I'm going to go to that gain adjustment and as I turn that up, what you'll find is the value, the command value inside the card post gain is going to increase as well. So now if I get up to about 5 volts, now I've only cut the size of my valve in half. And so what we say, 13 and a half gallon, 50 liter per minute valve. So now it's, you know, nominally speaking, it's about a 25 uh, liter per minute or about a, you know, a six, seven gallon per minute valve. Let's go back here and see what's happening. So if you kept track of how far this valve spool traveled before, that's the zero signal. Here comes my, my B solenoid fired up and that metering notch doesn't quite make it to the same place it did before. There might be a little bit of flow. We'd have to look deeper inside the valve to see what's uncovered and what's not. But that's a half-sized valve. That's allowing us to gain better resolution and control of a valve that's perhaps a little oversized with smaller flows and be able to use the full range of input command signal, whether it, whether it be uh, variable voltage or whether it be variable current. It won't matter. The, um, the, the gain adjustment allows you to, to resize that valve appropriately. Okay, that's what gain is. Now, I'm playing around with one particular brand of valve, but all of these concepts we're discussing today, like gain and dead band compensate and all those other features are common to whatever model and style of proportional valve you work with. So these are generic concepts, even if we're working with, a, with an Eaton Vickers valve. 
All right, from a troubleshooting point of view, let's just have a look what happens. Since we have an exposed valve spool, let's have a look what happens if the valve gets stuck. So I'm actually literally going to, I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to switch over to our A solenoid, and we'll push from the left. And I'm actually going to do something crazy. A very large contaminant is about to get stuck in our valve here. Would you agree? I put the screwdriver blade right into that metering notch. Now, before I start to turn it down, what you're going to notice here is that the LVDT and the, and the command signal are about matched. But as I turn it down now, what you'll find out is, is, that, um, is that they no longer match. And if those two numbers don't match, that's a pretty good indication that something has gone wrong. Those two, I've got negative 7 on one side and positive 8 on the other. Those two numbers aren't even close anymore where they should be almost exactly the same most of the time unless you get right to the end of stroke. But for most of the time what you'll see is that the command signal, condition command signal and the LVDT match. It's only when that valve spool gets stuck. I'm going to turn down my signal now. So watch the signal turn down on the left signal going down on the left that's the condition command signal but look what happened on the right the LVDT indicates that it didn't come along and in fact something very interesting happened here our command signal on the left changed polarity isn't that interesting I wonder what was happening there so it could be some interesting things at work and we'll find out more about that in a second all right what else do we need to cover here before we switch to the live running valve oh I know what we should do it would be a great opportunity for us to measure current and see what's happening with current. So I'm just going to turn off my electric for a moment and make some changes. I really like this type of adapter for diagnostics when working with the Hirschman uh, DIN style plugs. I can't remember the five uh, digit uh, DIN code at the moment. There's too many of those going around in my head. But it's a very common valve connector and you can buy this little diagnostic adapter which has a V on one side for parallel measurements in voltage and your fluke uh, leads plug right in there and stay nicely connected. Let me show you what I mean. I'll just find my probe there. They snugly fit in there and stay there all day long. So the V side is for parallel and voltage, but over on this side, very handy, is A for amperage. This is where we can measure current because you literally have to get a DC ammeter in series, which means cutting one of our two solenoid wires. No, wait, we don't have to cut the wire. We could just pull this little shunt out of place and the wire has been cut and now we'll get the meter to complete the circuit. So let's get all configured here to measure current. I'm going to put my connector back on, and the valve could stay running while you, um, while you measure current. So I confused myself a little bit as to which multimeter leads I've got. Here's my red set of meter leads from the right. All right, I'm going to plug those in. And before I turn my meter, I better set my meters into the amperage setting and move my probes. Don't forget to move your, your, your multimeter probes to the amperage position and get all configured easy to forget. Oh, and another thing that I commonly forget when doing DC current measurements with a, with a fluke meter is that when you go into the amperage mode on these fluke 87 mark 5 amperage mode you instantly start up in AC amperage which will give you the wrong range of measurements and things won't seem right and you want DC amperage and so you hit the yellow button and you switch over to DC current and that's really important to do because if you forget that, things get very confusing. All right, so my meter on the right is now doing DC current measurement in series with solenoid A, and I'm going to move my left multimeter also. I'm going to put that into play on my other diagnostic connection for amperage for the, for the B solenoid. I'm a little bit cramped here, but I think everything should fit. Yes, we're all back together now. And if all goes well when we fire up, we should be running. Yeah. All right. Find my little adjustment screwdriver. Current, current. I'm just going to take a moment to make sure I'm configured correctly. Don't want to let the smoke out of electronics. All right. We should be good to go. So what you're going to find out now is just how much current how much variable current is being driven? Which solenoid am I on? I'm on the A solenoid, so we'll watch over here on the right. The spool will push to the left from the solenoid on the right. And if we're watching 
our current, we're finding out that our current is slowly going up, and by the time I've sent a 5 volt command signal into the amplifier card, it's now producing 1.1 or roughly 1 amp of drive current to that A solenoid, and it's being done with pulse width modulation, a chopper circuit that is a series of on, off pulses. Learn more about pulse width modulation in our lessons on lunchboxsessions.com. And this solenoid is meant to go up to 2.7 amps of pulse width modulation variable current, and that's the wide open current drive for moving the valve to its maximum position. There's that metering notch. There it is. Okay, now this whole time I was working the, the, the input, the command signal, nothing was happening on the left multimeter, and that makes sense. I was asking for a control signal only to operate the A solenoid and move the spool to the left. So nothing showed up for the current for the B solenoid. Why would it? But let's now put my screwdriver, my major contaminant, back into the metering notch and jam the valve. And remember, there's an LVDT that is always sending information into the control electronics in the amplifier card. <coughs> and should the spool not go to the place where the command signal has commanded, the, the amplifier card with its closed loop control electronics is going to try to correct. So as I turn down the drive signal, and the valve spool return, fails to go home because it's jammed due to a major contaminant, watch that left multimeter. Watch what will happen on the left multimeter once I get down far enough. What's happening on the left multimeter? The current on the right has not only been turned off in a hopes of getting that valve spool back to center, but current has been turned on to the left solenoid in an attempt to force drive that spool back to center. That screwdriver is nicely stuck in there now. I can't even pull it out. Okay, unless I turn the signal back up and get the command and the LVDT to agree with each other, and then I can pull that screwdriver out. Otherwise, that left solenoid actually is driven to the on position by the amplifier card in the attempt to push through the jam and the contamination, and my screwdriver is stuck in there. It's been jammed in tight by an attempt by the control electronics to reestablish the correct position, which would be towards center, closed, yeah. So again, that's this particular amplifier, but lots of other manufacturers also use similar control schemes to try and correct the positioning of a, of a spool position monitored proportional valve. That's a valve that offers feedback for its positioning, and so I think we've seen a lot of interesting things happen now. What other questions might be popping up? Okay, great, I'm just gonna look through all your comments here. I'm glad you're enjoying that. Uh, yeah, so Jim asked, so the gain is a flow control? Yeah, it is in a way. I mean, it's not meant to be used as a flow control continuously, Jim. But yeah, it's, it's, it's going to control the maximum flow rate of the valve. And so the gain is used to resize the valve if the valve is a little too large for the maximum flow going through it. And then you can sort of downsize the valve a little bit. Yeah, so it does turn out to be control of flow. Let's look for some other question marks. I've got so many on the screen, so I look for question marks at the end of sentences, and that lets me know you've got a, a question. What is the difference between proportional solenoid and, uh, and normal solenoid, what Lingesh was asking? Yeah, the, the main difference is, is that a, an on-off solenoid a very basic on-off solenoid isn't much more than a winding of wire and there's a slug steel armature inside and when you turn it on it pushes that it pushes that solenoid all or sorry it pushes the armature and the spool all the way hard over into the position where it's going and by the way this type of solenoid gets weaker in its force strength the further the spool travels so it really isn't designed to do much other than a bam hit it hard right whereas the type of solenoid we have here in proportional valve is set up to produce almost a very even amount of force for every little increase in current and so that's done with very careful winding work and also involving the use of electro um, of permanent magnets and springs as well oh that just brought something to mind, springs. I'm glad we didn't uh, forget that, so thanks Lingesh for triggering that in my memory. 
the spring on either side of the spool is a rather important feature because when we turn up the current just a little bit and we move the spool to the left, why doesn't the spool travel hard over? Well, that's because the force being exerted by the solenoid has all of a sudden become equal to the new compressed strength of the spring and the spool stops traveling. So if I want more spool travel and a higher rate of flow out of my A work port, I need to turn up the current in that solenoid on the right here and push a little harder. And again, the valve spool motion will stop when the new compressed strength of the spring equals the force being exerted by the solenoid. Glad we had a moment to clarify that as well. I'll just look once more and see if there's any questions that are easy for me to wrap my head around here. Manwendra had a question. Let's see if I can follow it. Manwendra, you said, if reference does not match actual, then the controller gets turned off. Yeah, it gets turned off. I think you saw that. But this controller was so strong, Mandresh, that if, if the difference between the position from the feedback instrument and the command signal were different enough, the amplifier actually took such strong action that it actually went and powered the opposite side in an attempt to drive that spool back to center. So a very, very strong corrective action was taken in that case. Very good question. Let's see here. Other questions coming in. Good. Tool Time Chris says this is getting interesting. Good, good. I'm glad you're enjoying that. How to check. Let's see. All right, so lots of, lots of great uh, feedback coming in. I hope I'm not missing too many of your questions. Thanks again for, for being with us today. If you're tuning in partway through the presentation, this is our first time here at lunchboxsessions.com. This is our first time being on YouTube Live. And our topic today is fun with electrohydraulic proportional directional controls. That's just for the benefit of those of you who might be tuning in partway through our broadcast. And we've been going now for roughly just about an hour. Okay, and so now we're going to switch over from powering the cutaway valve to working with the, with the valve that can actually operate live hydraulics. So just so I don't cause any trouble, I'm going to turn off the electrical there and remove some cabling and hopefully not get too confused as to where I was going. I'm going to get rid of that valve. We're going to move that one out of the way. So goodbye cutaway valve. And um, just while I'm working here at the valve, those of you uh, who are wondering what happens to this video when we're all done, I mentioned that at the beginning, but I'll mention it now as well while I try to rearrange. I'm not the world's best multitasker, but I'll try to talk to you a little bit while rearranging the valves here. When we're all done, this video will be saved on Lunchbox Sessions YouTube channel, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards if you missed anything along the way. And I've got to hook up my LVDT here. All right. Try not to tangle too many of my cables. All right, we're back onto the actual valve. I think I dialed out most of my adjustments and settings earlier. And so I don't know what the noise is going to be like once I have the pump up and running. So I may speak a little louder and try to overcome that a little bit. So I'm back to measuring from the test ports, the measurement ports on the front of the amplifier card. I better switch my multimeters back to the voltage range. Be ready to do things the right way in that regard. Easy mistakes to make and then you blow a fuse maybe. Okay, so... I think I'm cabled back up. The left multimeter will read the condition command signal. The right multimeter will read the feedback positioning from the LVDT. And um, I'm set for my A solenoid, which is the solenoid over here on the right, which will produce flow um, on our A work port and cause clockwise rotation of our hydraulic motor. So I'm going to power that up. I need to go over to my hydraulics and get the pump running. We've got to have some flow from a source. So our pump is up and running. So now we're back into working with a hydraulic motor, which is ideal for this kind of spool for easy study. We'll be able to track the RPMs. We've got a tone wheel on the hydraulic motor. 
with four steel bolts on our aluminum tone wheel that get picked up by a, by a, by a sensor and uh, some divide by four math in our, in our tachometer to give us a true um, tachometer reading and the measurement of speed. So as you can see, I've got fairly fine control. Even though this valve, oh, well, we didn't look at the nameplate for this valve and we didn't go through the document, but it's a very similar valve to the one that we cut away except this one is a size 3 instead of a size 5 and it's rated for 20 liters per minute which is roughly 5 US gallons per minute so this valve is already sized quite a bit smaller and is giving me a reasonably good control of flow I have my pump set up to only produce half a gallon a minute at the moment so that's our maximum capable flow <coughs> but down here at the 7 o'clock position as you can see, I come up to the 8 o'clock position, no flow. We're still passing through the dead band. I'm at 9 o'clock position. That's 1.2 volts of command, condition command. Not much conditioning happening right now because I didn't dial up any, I didn't dial up any uh, gain change or, or dead band. But we're up to a volt point six of command signal. We're up to 2 and we still don't have the hydraulic motor turning. Oh, there we go. 2.4 volts command signal, and our, and our valve has cracked open. We finally passed through the dead band. Well, what did I say earlier? Uh, roughly 25% of the valve spool's travel is dead band. So that adds up. It's a 0 to 10 volt signal that we're using, and it took us almost to about 2.5 volts before we started to see any crack open condition on the valve and any flow. So that was us passing through the dead band, and here we are up at about the 9.30, 10 o'clock position on the potentiometer. And then as I increase it up to about the high noon position, which you and I know was about a 5-volt signal going in, it's about a 5-volt condition signal as well, and our LVDT indicates that it's playing along. Our LVDT feedback for the valve spool position is on the right multimeter. And that's all going just fine. There's, gonna, there's really no way for me to jam the spool and show you that uh, effect now that we've got a live running spool, but you saw that. But let's see what happens as I continue to turn this up. Will the motor go any faster? We're at 260 RPMs, and maybe as I continue to 7 volts, no, the motor didn't speed up, even though the valve is getting bigger. Here we are at the 3 o'clock position on the potentiometer and our command is almost at full voltage and our motor doesn't speed up. What does this tell us about the valve? If all this valve motion is taking place inside and our speed isn't changing, what do we know? We know that our system is now in saturation in that the larger the valve get, gets doesn't change the flow rate anymore. The valve itself is not a pressure drop and it is no longer metering flow as I mentioned earlier, I have my pump set to only produce 0.5 gallons per minute right now, roughly 2 liters per minute. So the valve is oversized. We probably should turn the valve size down, resize the valve, and get a better resolution. So that's where we would work with the gain. Okay, so let's just turn down the gain a little bit. We'll go to a full command, and I'm on the A solenoid, so I need to drop to my lower tuning potentiometer and I'm going to turn down the gain full command signal but I'm going to turn down the gain until our RPM start to drop there we go I'm just coming into a range where we'd have some control so I've turned down my gain just far enough and now what we should find out is that for our command signal now what you may be noticing here, our left multimeter is our command input monitored. But remember, this command input monitor is, is conditioned. It's post any adjustments for gain, deadband, ramps. I don't have ramps active. That yellow light would have to be on. I'd have to command the ramps to be active. I could do that. But I'm going to leave them off because I can't turn this potentiometer fast enough to demonstrate them. Okay, but what we find out is that even though I'm at a 10 volt external command signal to the amplifier card, my conditioned signal has been reinterpreted to being 
six volts, and that has changed now the, the full scaling of the zero to 10 volt input signal to be spread across a smaller amount of spool travel, increasing the resolution and control of the valve since the valve was really too large for the amount of flow that I'm working with. Oh yes, this is a 20 liter per minute rated valve, but believe it or not, there's actually a seven liter. Uh, there's actually a three liter, which is less than a, a single gallon per minute version of the spool, which would have different sizes of metering notches in it. Okay, so hopefully we're getting a good view of all that. Oh, I know what we should play around with. We should play around with the dead band compensator a little bit. But typically you would set the dead band compensator before the gain. So I'm going to switch the gain back to being full. As soon as I get on the little slot on my screw, we'll switch the gain back to being full. You can do both a gain and a dead band adjustment, but typically dead band is adjusted first. So what I'm going to try to do now is get rid of all of this signal between zero and two and a half that does nothing. Zero to two at the moment. I've probably changed it a little bit. Just let me make sure I got my A gain all the way back to the tippy top. Yes, I do. So now we're going to go to the dead band compensator and we're going to dial up a bunch of dead band compensator. In fact, the best way to do that, let me just go back down, best way to do that is just to move my potentiometer a very small amount of command and then dial this until we see our hydraulic motor start to turn. Maybe I didn't quite move it far enough. Oop, there we go. There we go. Okay, that's a big, that's a big adjustment. All right. So what you'll notice now, look at that. I dialed up the dead band so far that it drove the spool, that oversized spool, all the way past the saturation point, and I've literally lost my control, my, my proportional control. There will come a point here as I'm turning this dial down slowly, my external command, I'm at 9 o'clock, just passing below nine o'clock. And if we watch that hydraulic motor, it'll probably just quit as the dead band returns the spool to center. So I really overdid it. So really an oversized valve and too much dead band for my half gallon per minute application. Okay, maybe we'll just um, take our dead band down a little bit and see what difference it might make. Okay, so let's see if we don't end up full speed. Same thing. Really an oversized valve for a half gallon per minute application in all regards. There we go. Maybe I've got something. Let's see. No, I think I took my dead band almost all the way out again. All right, so that's dead band. We've had a look at gain adjustment. And once I take out my gain adjustment, or I think I restored gain earlier already, I'll take my dead band back out. And what we should be finding out, if we return the valve to its non-adjusted position, is that once again, our LVDT is tracking fairly closely to exactly what the command signal is, letting us know that the valve is responsive, it's not stuck. Again, this is our LVDT feedback over here, and if its, if it's number isn't matched roughly to the command signal, for a non-adjusted valve, or if it's not changing, as you know the command input is changing, then you know your valve is stuck. Some contaminants got in there and jammed things up. All right, that's been a bit of an introduction to the, the drive of proportional valves. I'm just going to shut my pump off, shut that down, and let's head back over here and see if there's some more questions that I can answer coming in. Uh, Naveen says, does all port blocked proportional valves create a drifting in hydraulic cylinders in the idle condition, um, in the nulled position? That is possible. Um, it depends on how much wear there is between the valve spool and the cylinder bore. If there's quite a bit of wear and there's now some leakage taking place. Single rod cylinders, as you know, are differential, so they're stronger in their extend strength and their retract strength. So all pressures being equal, it is possible that a flow can get through Naveen 
that a cylinder may drift towards the extend more likely than anything else if the valve won't seal up and, and block flow. And so, you know, sealing up to block flow, that's kind of the benefit of having the valve with, with dead band in it. It's uh, pro proportional valves are very finely machined at the beginning and um, the, the clearances are very small, can be as few as just a few microns of, uh, of diametrical clearance. And so the leakage shouldn't be, shouldn't be noticeable, but if the valve wears, then yes, you may have that, that issue. And, and hence the, the use of a system that has feedback then to make sure that the valve is driven to a place, maybe electrically, where cylinder drift stops. Great question. Uh, let's see, what else can I have a look at? Looking for question marks. Uh, Ali Bayrak is asking, what is the brand and code of proportional valve? The brands that I'm working with today are, Vic are Eaton Vickers proportional valves from the KFDG 4V series. And I put links to PDF files, data sheets for these exact valves that should be there on the YouTube page just below the video box in the more information. So you'll be able to download those. And a lot of similarities between the, the Eaton Vickers valves today and some of the ones that you might use from Bosch Rexroth, Atos, um, yeah, a number of other makers that I couldn't possibly remember today. Jim was asking, can you give an example of why you'd want a lot of dead band before the valve shifts? Yeah, Jim's question is kind of related to, uh, to Naveen's question, and that is that if you want your, your actuator to sit still when you're not sending in a, uh, a command, a valve with a lot of dead band or overlap allows for a, an easy condition to get that actuator to be at a dead stop for a time. Whereas a valve that is called a zero lap valve spool or a critical spool will have almost no overlap, will have, will have no overlap, and if that spool moves the slightest amount, you'll already have a signal driving your actuator. And then in order to stop the actuator, you'll need more live uh, reporting instrumentation to feed back to a control circuit and make constant corrections. And those types of hypersensitive control loops where you have zero lap critical response type of valves are very popular for, uh, for military aircraft where the flight control surfaces have to be connect, uh, corrected in real time to keep the flight stable. So yeah, there's lots of great applications out there and in industry too, uh, even in the sawmilling industry where cutting uh, lumber to very precise thicknesses and moving into positions quickly. But a lot of what we're now discussing kind of moves us into a discussion about servo valves and servo systems and then using some kind of a, a sensor, this one's magnetostrictive, to watch over the positioning of the cylinder. And that will become the subject of, I think, some future YouTube live sessions. We, put, we couldn't possibly crack open that topic today, uh, but some very good questions. Yeah, you bet. What else is coming in there? Does hydraulic fluid play any part in keeping proportional valves cool? Wow, yeah, that's, that's a good question, Jesse. Um, in order to carry away the heat for any hydraulic components that, um, that will generate heat, and certainly a proportional valve when only partially open and a very high pressure drop, maybe your proportional, uh, sorry, maybe your pro pressure compensated pump is set at a high pressure and the valve is barely cracked open so perhaps a very high pressure drop across the valve yes there will be heat and so it is critically important to have that heat taken away by the hydraulic fluid sure the fluid is the cooling medium I hope I answered that well could you explain the code A and B of the solenoid and the flow direction okay so for most valve spools, the standard that's being followed is that there is an A, there's a solenoid labeled A, and if that solenoid becomes active, this is our A solenoid, if that solenoid becomes active in a spool valve, this will be a push. Okay, there are sometimes in cartridge valves where, screw in cartridge valves where it could be a push or a pull, but the vast majority of, of spool valves, not screw and cartridge valves, the solenoid is a push solenoid. So if this solenoid comes on, that A solenoid is going to push. And so if you look at the symbol for the valve spool, which is pretty hard to see, I suppose I could change back to a, um, a simulation, but if you're looking at that symbol there, what you will now see is the box on the right 
with the two straight arrows moves into position where you see the letters P, A, B, and T. And so you would now create a path for flow from P to the A work port, which would typically be extending a cylinder if the typical standard is followed, or it would be to turn a hydraulic motor clockwise. Whereas if we operated the B, if we operated the B solenoid over here, that would give the spool a push that way. And now you look at the crossover arrows, and what you will see in the crossover arrows is that P will go to the B work port, and that will typically be to, uh, to retract the cylinder or turn the hydraulic motor counterclockwise. And of course, while P is going to B, you're letting oil from A return back to tank to complete the entire open center style hydraulic circuit and have it run correctly. I hope I answered that question all right. And what else is coming in? Can we control loop the hydraulic cylinder to avoid drifting due to spoolie? Yeah, Naveen, again, great question. Could we control the, uh, the, the whole hydraulic closed loop system and monitor the cylinder position? Absolutely. And so that is the point of this type of sensor, which is threaded up the back end of a cylinder. This particular one uses a magnet on the piston. And so yes, your control electronics can make corrections for a valve that is indeed zero lapped. This is a Moog um, servo valve. And that will be the subject of some future YouTube lives and we'll get those types of cylinders running very critical. You can have multiple loops of control. You can control the position of the valve. You can close loop control the position of the cylinder and create some very complex closed loop position control systems with different types of hydraulic technology. All right, let me look at my, um, at my cue sheets to see what else we were going to cover today. I think we're doing pretty good and perhaps we'll, uh, we'll come towards a close here. I hope I've answered a fair number of your, of your questions. What signal do you see with a bad LVDT? Max is, um, is asking. Well, a number of things can happen with a bad LVDT. Um, actually, let's, um, maybe we'll just turn the pump back on one more time. Thank you, Max, for that. So let's have a bad, let's have a really bad LVDT here. I'll get the, uh, I'll get the hydraulic motor running. There are three leads, Jim, that come back from the LVDT. And if I pull, so LVDT is our multimeter on the right, which is indicating um, three volts right now, which is matched to our command. So everything's happy, the system is responding. And if one of my wires gets cut, and it doesn't matter which one, um, on, this particular, on this particular valve, it looks like our LVDT signal jumped all the way to 13 volts, which is outside the range of our zero to 10 volt. It, it should have been a match. And oh, look down here on this particular amplifier. We have a red light on from the LVDT failure, letting us know that something has gone wrong. And yes, we've gone to a number outside the range of our zero to 10 volts. As I repair my LVDT, things come back into range. So that's one example. Yeah. Great question, Max. Um, some of you are saying can't wait for servo valves. Yeah, okay, we'll have to get ready for that and do that on another day. Perhaps I'll just pop back into my PDF file here for just a moment. I'll go to that size three valve that we were running live. This manual looks the same as the other one that we looked at earlier, but this is for the smaller series of valves, the, the size three valves. And uh, just to have a look at the integrated electronics. If we scroll down, I hope that's not making you dizzy how fast I'm moving. There's so much data we won't have time to look at today. So many interesting things. But what I am looking for, let's just see if I can find it, is a bit of a depiction of the, of the electronic card that you would have. There you go. There's a depiction of the electronic card that you would have if you had the integrated electronics, meaning that the amplifier electronics is on board the valve and not mounted in a, a module in a control cabinet like what we were having today. And what you find out, of course, is that you don't have quite as many options. What you end up with is only seven pins. That's a very common configuration. You'll find out that the deadband compensator has been permanently set in this type of valve. 
In some cases, the gain is already set. Some valves like this will give you some little tuning um, potentiometers for ramps. Some will not. But what is interesting to see about the integral amplifier is they did give an output from the LVDT. And so that output, that monitor output from the LVDT, even for the valve with the built-in LVDT, is a really handy thing for us to see. You could have your PLC monitoring that output very easily. And if you knew from your PLC's code that you had changed your command signal going in, you see where it says command there, inverting, non-inverting, if you knew, if your PLC's logic was programmed to say, hey, we just sent in a change signal to the valve to change its position, and monitoring output did not change or did not spit back the, the correct value, that too could be used to detect a jammed valve spool because the LVDT did not respond. So that could also be very helpful in troubleshooting. All right. I think that's going to draw our time to a conclusion. Uh, conclusion today and um, you know I want to give some some credit to everyone who works here at Lunchbox Sessions we've got a lot of fabulous people working hard to produce the content that we have and so I'm Carl Owen's been on the camera instructor Mark hopefully you'll see him here before too long and then also working hard on our content here we've got Nathan Crystal Robin and Chris I thank them all Ivan works hard on the system overall for lunchboxsessions.com. Alex is here working on electrical and Lenore in the office and also special mention to Ted, Keelan, Emily and Grant who've contributed a lot. And, uh, and that's our whole gang here. I wouldn't mind if I could take a moment to show you Lunchbox Sessions, the actual website lunchboxsessions.com. If you haven't visited, this is a great place where you can jump in and take some lessons on topics like proportional valves. In fact, there's our metering notches. So if you don't have valves that you can play with at your place of work, here you are, uncovering the metering notch and seeing the increase in flow and downstream pressure. We talked a little bit about dead bend. Well, here is a graph that depicts that dead bend, saying that as the valve moves in each direction, this would be P to A flow, this diagonal typically, this one over here in the lower left would be P to B flow. And here we are finding that for a certain amount of displacement of the internal spool, there is no change in the flow rate. Flow is on the y-axis. And that's a depiction there about dead bend. And you saw a mechanism for us to be able to compensate for a spool. See, that spool has a lot of overlap, right? It's not a critical spool. When we study servo valves, we're going to find out that the slightest change in position of the spool results in a change of flow. So those are things that you'll be able to learn on lunchboxsessions.com. Feel free to check out that resource, our website. Again, uh, thanks to our friends at fluidpowerworld.com, a great place to go to find out about uh, fluid power technology and the conference. On April 28th, we're going to do this again at about exactly the same time, and we'll be covering piloting pressures and pilot controllers, both a manual type of stick and also some electrohydraulics there too. So I really want to thank everyone for tuning in today. If I didn't catch your question, uh, please do email me, info at lunchboxsessions.com, or look me up on LinkedIn, Carl Dyke Industrial Teacher, and send me a, an invite to connect, and we'll chat there as well. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And this is Carl from lunchboxsessions.com signing off. See you next time. Thanks. <laughs>